I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone. Welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of the Black Wealth Renaissance Podcast. Your boy David Bella, one fourth of the Black Wealth Renaissance, checking in with my co host Fellas, how y'all feeling? What up, what up, what up? It's your boy Jalen, man. Another quarter of the Black Wealth Renaissance. Feeling good, feeling great. It's a lovely Saturday. The weather's great, yeah. man. The energy's great. Had a great week. So it, it, I'm, I'm feeling good, man. Yeah, man, it's been a dope week. Kelly, how you living, bro? Man, I'm good. I'm good, man. Been busy all week trying to buy a damn property. It's been, I've been fucking busy as hell. But I'm happy. I'm glad to be here on this Saturday. I'm enjoying this podcast. I feel like it's going to be a great podcast this week. Yeah, so, man, I got the energy rolling. And as you can see, if you're watching this, we got us an in-person guest. Um, this lovely young lady sitting to my right is our personal virtual assistant for Black Wolf <laughs> Renaissance. So, like, we we had to get on here because she is showing people how to kill it in the VA game. She's a real estate investor and part of the debt-free community. Miss Annalisa A. Bear. Annalisa, how you living? I'm doing amazing. I'm so excited to be here, especially because I've been following you all for so long. We work together. So I'm super happy to be here and in person. So yeah, I'm exci excited to share my story. I just want to say thank you yeah. for pulling up, flying it's out like to you. Dallas, you know, real one. Pulled up uh, to the green room. Yeah, we definitely, definitely appreciate it. Hey, anybody else who try to get on the podcast, I'm just saying, if you can't pull up on us, it's a new requirement. It's starting to look a little bleak if you yeah, can't, you yeah. can't come I'm just, sit I'm in the just room. saying, man. <laughs> if you can't come sit with us, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, but as Jalen was saying, Lisa, thank you so much for pulling up. Uh, so for all our followers, anybody that's listening that's unfamiliar with you, can you give them an introduction to yourself? Of course, of course. It's so hard to like define who I am, but if you all don't follow me on Instagram or Twitter, my name is Annalisa Abel. I'm originally from Kentucky. I currently live in Ohio. As they mentioned, I do invest in real estate with hopes to kind of expand my portfolio. So I'm currently a landlord. I own a virtual assistant and social media management agency called Elevated Assist. And we basically help uh, small business owners owners take care of the day-to-day -day, um, in the background, as well as ma manage social media accounts. Um, I also am a content creator as well as a course creator. So I have several courses related to how to become debt-free, how to make money anywhere as a virtual assistant, which is one of my most popular courses, as well as how to make six figures as a social media manager. Um, in addition to all of that, I currently still have a nine to five and I'm a healthcare administrator. So I work, I'm able to work remotely from home. I think that's it. Oh, and I also have financial I flex. flex. I, let know. I, I also have financial flex, which is an opportunity opportunity for me to have conversations and sit down with entrepreneurs, business owners, and careerists with the opportunity for them to share their financial success so they can inspire my audience to be their own personal finance goals. So we do that on Instagram Live um, very frequently. We just have a good time talking about getting this money. So I'm happy to be here. Dope, dope, dope. Well, once again, we welcome you to the show. Appreciate you for coming on. Of course. And uh, we can just get started and really just dive deep into it, like, like you were talking about all of the things that you do. I, I really want to start with the beginning with yeah. the first time I was introduced to you was through your debt free journey. Yes. Um, so can we go into that? Like what inspired you to go that route? Because you know, it is people always look at like getting debt free is like it's not beneficial. So like what made you want to do that route? I mean, for me in the very beginning of like my whole financial journey, and I've always been really good with my money for the most part. Um, so I got to a point where I was just like, I'm have extra money where I can, it can just go towards something beneficial. So it might as well go towards my debt. I mean, I didn't have a lot of student loans, but in combination with my student loans, credit card debt, like I think I had purchased like furniture for my new place, as well as my car loan. Um, I had like $30,000 in debt and I was just like, it just doesn't make sense for me to have it if I have this extra money to pay it off. Um, as well as me just preparing to get into real estate investing. It just made, it just made sense at that time. So I was able to pay off that debt and just um, lift that burden off of me and not be a slave to debt. So when you think about ownership and just owning things, I don't want to be owned by debt and mm. be burdened by that. So, you know, I it was step by step. It was a fairly e easy process. I mean, if you set your goals to do certain things, I mean, it's easy to easy to do. So, so on that journey, what, what was the first 
how did you attack it? Like, what was the very first loan? Maybe was it a credit card that you started paying off? Did you use the avalanche method, mm-hmm. snowball method? Like, how'd you okay. attack that? I know y'all know about the debt-free methods. I love <laughs> to see it. Um, so I started with the snowball method. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically um, tackling the smallest amount first so you can get some of those quick wins. So I think it was a credit card for me. Um, I paid that off first. And then I think... I think it was car loan and then it was student loans. And again, I mean, I was on scholarship for my bachelor's degree and even my master's degree. So um, I didn't really have a lot of student loans. And about how long did it take for you to pay off all of your debt? Well, after I like actually started that plan, it probably took um, 15 months or so, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit more than that. So I was able to pay off my debt as of March 2019. Hey, that's not bad know, that's at all. Dope. So that's dope. Were yeah. you were you like really aggressive with it? Like all of your extra money, you was just really like just trying to, you know, focus with it. Was it like a certain percentage that you were going with? Maybe you're like, you know, I'm gonna go 20 percent uh, over this next 15 months. How how'd you figure it out? So, I mean, like for me, I always had like at least two sources of income. It'll be like your nine to five, your main or I might have like a side job at like a retail uh, store or something like that. So at this time I was living in northern Ohio mm-hmm. in Lima, Ohio, which is a very, very rural area. I mean, they didn't have a Kroger. They didn't have a Chick-fil-A. Sound so like where I, we from. Like it was a very, very small town, which I wasn't used to. So honestly, I didn't I didn't have any distractions or anything. So I didn't have nothing but time. So I was like, let me go ahead and give me another job or something Mm -hmm. so I can stack this money. I know I want to invest in real estate in the next year or so. So um, I was a brand ambassador for this company and I ended up making like a lot of money with them. So I just had like extra money. So it's easy for me to just like pay off um, debt like uh, every month or so. And again, I'm not, I'm not a fan of like the Dave Ramsey method. I don't think you should just like live like you completely broke and all of that and not enjoy your life. No, I'm not going to tell you to do that. So like even in my course, I'll tell you, figure out what that balance looks like for you so you can enjoy enjoy your life, but also being able to pay off debt and be financially responsible. Mm -hmm. I like that. So does that mean that are you frugal, though? Like, do what do you what do you like? Is there certain things that you'll be like, okay, I'm not going to overspend on this versus like other things that you'll be like, you know, I'll drop a bag on that. Like. Look, my friends will tell me I'm frugal all the time, but then tell the people, oh, she's rich. She got money. So it's certain, <laughs> where, they, where they come from. <laughs> it's I, I'm going to pay it's all priorities. Right it's, it's all about priorities. Like I'm going to invest my money into things that are going to make me money. So like if you see me driving my car, you probably think I'm broke because I could definitely use a new car. But I keep telling my parents, I'm going to wait until the wheels fall off. You know, it's going to get me from point A to point B. But obviously, if I wanted to purchase me a car right now, you know, I can do I can do that. So if y'all randomly see me in a tesla don't say nothing because you know i can afford it because she ran it up with the va <laughs> bag and the social media but, bag. exactly exactly I, I like i like that we even going into your debt-free journey just because it highlights a couple things in my opinion like for one that timeline people always want stuff to happen like right away um it took 15 months even though you had a plan and all it took 15 months and it also took for you to increase your income that's something anthony and janika they talk about a lot like whenever it comes to paying down debt, everybody kind of wants to, it, a lot of people that do want to be debt free, that's like the hurdle they see. They're like, oh, I can't with whatever I'm making. But at one point you just got to make more money. So exactly. Like no, exactly. Because even when I was at some one point during my, um, my debt free program and things like that, I was doing consultations with people and I was going through their budgets and I was like, you don't even have enough money to be able to start even paying off your debt. Like we need to figure out what's going to be an additional source of income for you so you can ex- like still live and pay off the essential things that you need as well as paying off your debt. So that, that happens for a lot of people. They just don't even have enough money to be able to pay off their debt. So my, you know, if anyone talks to me on a regular basis, I'm always saying you need more than one stream of income. You need multiple sources. You can't rely on just your nine to five. So my first goal with anyone that I work with is like, how can you monetize something that you are passionate about? How you can how can you monetize something that is valuable to someone um, within your circle and make money that way to help you pay off your debt or even to live your best life, even if you don't have debt? Mm. And with with the thought pattern of always having more than one job, how long have you been a subscriber to that? Like, was this something you saw your parents doing as a kid? Like, are you just really just didn't like being broke? It's probably because I really didn't just like being broke. And let me just correct that. I've never been broke, but, um, she <laughs> but, <rich>. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I just, um, 
I just like having money. And if, again, if people follow me, if they tune into any of my webinars and any conversations that I have, I always say, I never want to be in a situation where I can't do something because of money. So if I can't do something, it needs to be another reason. Money should not be that. And I don't want to look at somebody else's lives and be like, oh, that's goals. No, I want my own life to be mm. goals. And I know the things that I want to do, uh, it requires money. It requires me to do, do things like I like to travel, which is not cheap. And when I go on vacation, I don't want to have a budget. I want to do what I want to do. So, I mean, it comes from that. Um, and again, like I mentioned, I've always been like a saver um, and just preparing for things that I really want to invest in. Mm, that, that, so, that's, oh, what you got, Kelly? I was just going to say, how do, how do you balance that? So somebody that wants to pay down debt and also still wants to travel, how do you balance that, that uh, aspect of your life? Well, you have to you have to one figure out what your why is and why you want to pay off debt in the beginning and then determine what that process looks like. Does the avalanche method make sense for you? Does the snowball method make sense for you? Like what's your ultimate goal with paying off debt? Is it truly impacting your credit score where you can acquire certain things? But again, within my program, it needs to be some type of balance. Again, you can spend your whole life or several months paying off debt and you hate your life in that time because you have this super, super strict budget, but we only get one life. So I think it's all about balance. So reward, you can reward yourself with travel um, by paying off a, a large amount of debt at a time. Mm. And, you know, you're talking about the budget, but you also just said on my, on my trip, I don't want a budget. I want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So like, is there a special account that you have for tra for traveling that you're like, you know what, this is where I'm going to go whenever I'm going traveling. Are you just like, you know what, fuck it. I'm going ball out on my trip. I'm turning up. Uh, it used to be like that for me, but you know, I'm doing okay right now. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it kind of just all goes together. Hey man, pressure, <laughs> a whole lot of pressure, man. Still, the money bucket idea, that's still very useful for anybody, though, mm -hmm. like whenever they're getting started with it, like when they're still paying off debt, because at the very least, you can look at that pot growing at the, whenever you know you got that, whatever that magic number is for your trip, now nah, I got this and that's all this is for, because it's yes. in this account. I will say during my journey, I did, I did separate things like even when I was um, going through my debt-free process, I was budgeting for tra a travel expense because I do like to travel um, and just things come up that I want to be a part of. So I did separate it with an app called Capital where you're able to like, I think I had yeah, like- Capital with a Q, right? Capital with a Q, yep. yes. So I was using that and then you can also actually invest with that app too. But um, I had like a separate budget for vacations. I had a separate budget for- um, like when I was going to get a car and save for a car and then, you know, money just keeps flowing. So I, it's just all together now. But that's interesting because you so you said, you know, in the beginning in my journey, it's levels to that. Like if it's someone who's like highly in debt, I definitely think that you should budget and figure out, you know what, this is what I need to cut out. This is like how I'm going to stop the bleeding. Shout out to our book, Managing Money Like the 1%. Yeah. cop that go yes. pick that up but yeah you definitely should stop the bleeding and figure out you know where's all my excess money going to before you just start saying you know what i'm about to start traveling and everything like that for sure like even in the beginning of my journey i wrote down like where all of my money was going so you know there was something thing some things i eliminated and it was very small like i had a um an audible that was maybe 15 dollars a month and i was like i can get this i can get audiobooks from the library for free or i can go to the library for books for free and um, like, I think I stopped getting my nails done. I was, but I, you know, I got to get my pedicure. So for a period of time, I stopped getting my nails done. You know, I made certain sacrifices for the long-term gain just to figure out like where truly is my money going and what's gonna, what I'm paying for, how beneficial is it for me? Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of want to roll into, cause you touched on it, like going into the real estate journey. So yep. you paid mm -hmm. off all this debt you got done in the 15 months. What did that process look like for you to start and go into real estate? So actually, I always wanted to go into real estate. So for people listening, I actually house hack a duplex in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. So in college, probably my junior year of college, I was living in a townhouse and like I had three other roommates and we would all put some, our money together. And I was like, we sending this check off to this guy every month. And I was and he like, paid. he's getting paid because we it was multiple units within the complex. And I'm just like, oh, I need to figure out what he's doing. Like I knew nothing about real estate. I just knew he was getting money on a reoccurring basis. And so I needed to figure out like, what is he doing? So I started to research and I kind of learned about house hacking and living in multifamily units. But I was living in Lexington, Kentucky at the time. And 
there weren't very many multifamily units. So after moving from Northern Ohio to Cincinnati, and if I don't know if you all been in Ohio before, but there's a lot of multifamily units everywhere. So I was like, this is a prime opportunity for me to um, find a duplex, find a triplex or something and house hack in that way. So when I, once I moved from Northern Ohio, my brother had already been living in Cincinnati. So I actually lived with him for three months. Cause I was like, at this point, I never want to pay rent again. I'm never going back. <laughs> so I lived with him and his, uh, his wife, who, who's now his wife um, for like three months and Lord, they got kids. Like that's temporary sacrifice. If you need to learn anything from that temporary sacrifice, cause it was um, uncomfortable. I like my own space. If anybody knows me, I, I'm a loner sometimes. So um, yeah, temporary sacrifice. So I lived with them for about three months until I found like the right place that I feel like I felt comfortable living in. Mm -hmm. So what was that process like whenever you're going through with the uh, FHA? I know we talked about it a lot. Uh, you went with the 3.5% 3, 3 down? I actually did a conventional loan and did 5% down. Mm, okay, that's interesting because I know a lot of people. Whenever they do talk about house hacking, mm -hmm. they they'll say FHA the FHA. FHA. Uh, so mm -hmm. what 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 made you go with the conventional loan versus the FHA? Well, um, my lender, lender just thought it would be beneficial for me over time, just because I had a really great credit score, and you know. It, it, anything out of that conversation, he was surprised I didn't have any debt. So, I mean, and that was mm. beneficial when, you, when you're just looking at your debt to income ratio and things like that, when you're purchasing homes and things. Um, but he just felt like that would be the most beneficial opportunity for me. And I only had to put a uh, 5% down. So yeah, I tell everyone that they should be house hacked before you get your dream house. Um, and I, full transparency. I mean, I only put like $3,600 down. And hey, that's 5% though. Like, and a lot of people sometimes whenever they hear conventional, they think I got to put the 20% mm -hmm. down. Mm -mm. And I'm glad that you said the five, but was the 5% due to you having the great credit score plus the minimal amount of debt, like no debt? It, it was mostly due to your, your credit score, but also in, I just want to be mindful that I had grants and stuff that I was able to apply to it too, mm -hmm. which is also awesome. Um, cause I was definitely prepared to pay more than that. Cause I knew I wanted to live in a duplex and house hack and eliminate some of my housing expense. Um, but yeah, the, the process overall was pretty uh, seamless. I looked at maybe a total of five or six multifamily units. And for me, you know, I didn't want, I wanted something that I can actually feel comfortable living in. Cause mm -hmm. I was going to be living in there and the bathroom needed to look pretty. So I found me a bathroom and it looked pretty. So I was like, put the offer in now. <laughs> <laughs> With the, with the grants, um, can you talk about like what type of grants were available? Are these like just state of Ohio grants, federal grants, or like first time home money? Can we get into that? So actually, when going through my process and finding a, a lender that I thought was a good fit for me, the first question I asked, I, well, the first thing I told them is I'm looking for a multifamily unit. I want to be able to house hack, but I'm also looking for grant opportunities so that I can pay down. Um, so I don't have to bring a lot of money to the mm -hmm. table, even though even if I did have it again, Annalise is frugal. Um, but it was certain lenders when I pulled up, when I brought up grants, they just kind of gave me like, uh, we'll see are what you, we can are, do. Are you broke vibes? Yeah. Like, like it was a very weird energy. But then once I had a conversation with Chase, they were like, oh yeah, I know you can have, you can apply this grant. And then they actually gave me an additional grant that I was unaware of for the Cincinnati area. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go with this. I'm going to go with this lender because, you know, they provided me with what I needed. Hmm. And Where'd you get like that thought pattern to ask for the grants? Did you kind of maybe see somebody talking about real estate or did you have mm -hmm. kind of like a mentor or something like that? I mean, I knew that grants existed. So uh, if you know me, then if the money's out there, I'm going to find it. So I'm all about Googling and figuring out what's going to be the best method um, and how I can do the least expensive route. So I think I did a lot of research and things like that. Like, I don't know anybody else that was like applying grants or anything, but mm -mm. Hey, if you only put, like you said, 3600 down, you got this house. How, how much is it you cash flowing, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so um, the so I pay like two, basically I'm paying $200 to live there. So the, I'm renting out the, the other side, obviously. I mean, everything goes in my business account. So we, But still, though, like $200 to, for a house you own? Come yeah. on, you, you can't beat that. Yeah, can't. no, it's, it's, it's great. No complaints. So when, whenever you move from there, what you're going to do with it? Is it going to be another long-term rental? Are you thinking about Airbnb and it out? How you, what you, what's your I extra probably, strategy? I'm not completely familiar with the Air, Airbnb and within the Cincinnati, Ohio. I personally would not look for Airbnb <laughs> in Cincinnati, Ohio, but sorry if you're listening from Cincinnati, Ohio. My bad. <laughs> but um, 
I probably I'm gonna rent it out. So mm-hmm. I mean that's the ultimate goal. It's a really nice property. So I really appreciate it. So I probably rent out the other side. But that's the thing that I love is that I'm not tied down to any location. So I can kind of get up and go as I please. It's yeah. the virtual assistant mm-hmm. business. Exactly. Yeah. My whole my and whole life is home. my whole life is freaking remote. Like I love it. I love it. This is a nomad type vibe. Yes. So I just want to say if if people, those are listening that are listening about grants. Uh, I do know there's a grant program in Texas. If you go to the Texas State Affordable Housing Corporation.com, you can get a lot of different grants for home buying processes. Okay, then we come through. Come through. Look. We love it. Y'all better go <laughs> go sign up for that. I'm telling y'all. But and David kind of alluded to it. I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna get into the VAs. I kind of want to move because I'm thinking about the timeline. I kind of want to move into financial flex. Mm, like okay. what 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 made you start Financial Flex? Because that was the first time you came on my radar. <laughs> like David, I, I was a guest. Yeah, on David Flex. was a guest. He was like, "Yo, I'm about to do this Instagram show with this girl, Anna Lisa." I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna tap in, my brother." And I was like, "Oh, this is pretty dope. I like it." So, what what inspired that? How, how'd you get that? So it's interesting. I was talking to a guy at the time, and he was and anybody that comes in contact with me with me, I'm always talking about like finance related things because you know I want us all to be free. It's not even about money. It's more so about freedom for me. Mm. Um, and he was just like, I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't know about this stuff. Like you talking about debt, you talking about you know different streams of income, uh, monetizing different things. You should put yourself out there. And I'm like, okay, so. <laughs> I actually, my first uh, live was probably last year around this time. It was with um, someone that's my sorority sister and she had her own, she was on her debt-free journey and I had already paid off my debt. Mm -hmm. But the first time we did that live, I had about 50 people in there, which for live is actually good. And I only had like 800 followers at the time. And I'm over here like, okay, (laughs) little on me. And it's it's funny because, uh, well, it's probably because of a number of things. Like people probably got on Instagram and was just like, why is Annalisa going live? She don't even be getting on social media like that. (laughs) And then two, just tapping in to learn about, you know, how you can pay off your debt, especially with a lot of professionals that I know that still have like student loans and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting that you say, you know, you are always talking about these things. So as a kid, was like financial literacy taught heavy in your home? Like, Mm -mm. So my mom and my dad, great, excellent parents. They raised four kids. They did what they had to do, but we didn't talk about finances. Mm -hmm. We did not talk about money at all. And I, you know, I want that to be completely different when I start a family, because I think having those conversations early will allow you to be a little bit more successful. Like if I would, if I knew what I knew now, like in high school, my, you know, my trajectory in my life would be completely different. So, you know, I mean, I don't fault them from that because they didn't know that, but it's just interesting how the tables turn because I feel like I'm teaching them about like investing in real estate now, investing in the stock market now. And nobody really prepares you to kind of have those conversations Mm -hmm. with your parents and things like that. So no, we did not talk about finances. Um, My parents, I wouldn't, their occupations were never described as being entrepreneurs. I think Mm -hmm. my dad temporarily had like a cleaning service, but it was definitely short-lived. Um, but no, we didn't talk about finances. I mean, we got allowances sometimes. And again, I was able to learn how to like save my money for things that I really wanted to buy. But, you know, I wish we would, we could have had those financial conversations, but again, they can't teach me what was never taught to them. Exactly. So so where did that mindset of the, like you being very aware of like finances, even like you having the wherewithal to say, yo, we all paying this one guy, this amount of money every month. Where did that come from? Did you start learning about that in uh, college? Maybe you like took a finance class over your major. I mean, I think that I think when you think about like money in just its true form, that you don't even have to have those conversations to to be able to reflect and just think that I don't have money. And I know in real life, I got to have money to be able to do stuff like it doesn't even have to be a super profound thought. It's just the fact that, you know, that you lack something and mm-hmm. you're not able to do certain things in life. And it, at the end of the day, it always comes down to money and what you have to pay for. So I think I just going through different experiences where, you know, your parents are like, no, we ain't got money for that right now. Mm-hmm. And how that translates as you grow up and become an adult and just you don't want to maybe have that conversation for your kid. Are you just mm-hmm. not? It just needs to be a different conversation. So I think as we grow up, we see our parents paying bills and they they give us that comment. No, we can't afford that right now. or We mm-hmm. can't do that. And then as you grow up and, and understand money a little bit more, you realize that, you know, life is hard out here, you know in high school and maybe even college, you probably thought that, you know, 
you'll be solid and being able to do everything you want to do with like an $85,000 salary when it's just like, you can do some things, but not necessarily the the things that you may really want to do. Mm-hmm. So for me, again, I like to travel. I like nice things. And at the end of the day, money is required for that. Mm-hmm. And I kind of want to go back and just to that conversation about with the parents, because I think that's something important for our generation as a whole, like, a lot of our parents and stuff, they didn't, they didn't have the access to this information. Like, exactly. we do. like we grew up, we got this internet, we got uh, so many platforms like this one and other ones that are teaching these things like financial flex. Like we had that exposure. So it's almost our, it's our responsibility at this point to teach it up exactly. and pass that information up because they, they just did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't need at the time. Like now this is the season of this. Like, we got more and more people wanting to learn. We got everybody trying to understand finances on a better level. And we got to make sure that we don't leave them uh, leave them behind, too, because I know with my parents and them, man, I'll be trying to help them with it. It's like <laughs> trying to look at their they financial picture and see, like, OK, what can I do to help y'all? Because y'all spent y'all time providing for us, you know? Exactly. I mean, you we have to think about how our parents were raised and then how their parents were raised and being even being slaves and things like that. Their mindset is going to be completely different. So when we think about transitioning and getting on some type of financial journey and saying, you know, I have an abundant mindset, I have a growth mindset, that transition for them is going to be completely different just because of how their parents probably raised them Mm -hmm. and having the whole slave mentality, meaning that I'm going to get me a good job. I'm going to work there for 40 years. And like, that's life for them. Mm. Whereas when I have conversations with my parents, the idea of working for one place for 40 years sounds terrible to me. I have no idea why someone would want that. <laughs> like it sounds, it sounds terrible to me. And you know, you just have to think about like how they were brought up and how they were raised. And in the environment that we are raised, we have access to so much information with the internet and being able to Google different things and different ideas. And they didn't have that access to be able to do that type of that type of thing. So again, I don't fault them for the things that they didn't teach me. Um, I appreciate being knowledgeable about certain things and certain spaces to be able to teach my parents that. But transitioning from, again, I hate to say that slave mindset um, and thinking that you might owe the owe the community something or feeling like the government's going to save you when in reality, it's not, it's not that. So having those tough conversations with my parents and trying to get them to ch- shift their mindset, um, it's challenging, but I think it's worth it. Mm. Okay. I like it. And I, I kind of want to go back to financial flex. Uh, jumping back, you know, you've done your first episode. You had the 50 uh, people on live. Did you immediately do another one the next week and then the ball yes. was just on? Yes. So let me just go ahead and give my flowers to all my special social media friends out there that be supporting me because I don't even know you all. But yeah, I definitely be sharing my content. And it's at the point now with financial flex that people are like, So who's going to be on next week? Or can you get this person on? Or can you get someone to talk about this? So people are getting excited about it, Mm. which I appreciate. And I love that. So I love going on live. Um, But now that my schedule is getting more busy, I'm trying to transition to figure out what's going to be the best method for me to be able to get this information to the right people um, so they can be able to execute and be their own personal finance goals. Um, So I did do an episode like immediately after. It was pretty consistent for the most. Yeah, it was pretty consistent for the most part. Um, and again, I get the opportunity to learn from like industry experts. Mm-hmm. Yes, I invest in real estate, but I don't, I wouldn't define myself as an expert. Mm-hmm. So I'm able to, to learn from other people. So it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I like that. I like that. So I, I, you got any more, the, I know you want to go into financial flex a little bit. No, I, no, I, I, I was about this, to say, I actually want to move this, into entrepreneurship. This, now. This <laughs> yeah. elevated assist, yeah. man. Yeah. I want, I want to know I how want that, people, how that started. I want to let, cause. But first, you got to let people know, my girl built a six-figure VA business, social media manager, so like, let's give her the flowers for that. So can we get into how that journey started? Like, how did you find your way into this social media manager VA space? So it's very interesting. So if y'all, if anybody knows me, I mean, I'm going to bring the great, I'm going to bring the energy. I believe I'm a money magnet. I receive money expectantly and unexpectedly. Like I don't worry about anything. I live in abundance. So I this, out of nowhere, Andre Hatchett, who's been on you all's podcast Shout out to Andre. the go the go he actually had reached out to me and said do i do admin work and you know me i'm like okay sound like another stream of income to me bet so i started working with him um and then after just working with him i'm like oh let me research and like is this a is this a legit business so 
you know, I research more about starting a virtual assistant business and I understand the needs of social media for business owners. So I created Elevated Assist last year um, and it's been booming. Like word of mouth is amazing. I barely do any marketing for it. And then I always have a consultation and I'm able, what I love about it is one, I'm able to um, help entrepreneurs that look like me and I'm able to help them succeed within their business by taking some of those tasks off their hands. So it's definitely not just me. I definitely do have a team, which is amazing. But to see the growth process in it is unbelievable. In addition to the education aspect in starting the digital product in the digital uh, in the virtual program of how to make money anywhere as a virtual assistant with my students. I have students that took my course and in 30 days they had three clients. Oh, wow. So when I tell people you need to tap in right now more than ever, the time is now to be able to make money remotely. Again, I love to be able to travel and still being able to make money and do work. I, I love that I don't have to be secure at one solid location. If we didn't learn anything from 2020, 2020 is that people can do their jobs at home. That's a fact. That's a fact. And if you can do it at home, you can do it from anywhere. Exactly. So um, I think being a virtual assistant, like people always ask what type of education, what experience do you need? You already have the tools that you need. Pull from the prior work experience that you have, pull from what you learned in school and monetize that and package that correctly within your virtual assistant um, business. So that's kind of the, some of the things that I teach in my program. I currently have over 250 people within my virtual assistant program. <laughs> and it was actually just recently launched in January. So that's, Come def on, that's definitely amazing. So Come I'm, on, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm super blessed. And we just recently launched our pre-sale for how to make six, six figures as a social media uh, manager. Because I've learned that a lot of people that have consultations with me, they may not necessarily need a virtual assistant. They need a social media manager. They realize that it's very important to have that social media presence for their business online, but they don't want to do it. They don't have time to do it, and their time's a little bit more valuable. So now I'm in the process of starting a master class at the end of the month to teach people, you know, how to create really good content within Canva, within those uh, graphic design spaces, so that you can market yourself correctly to be a social media manager. Mm, come on, so, man. Okay. That's a lot yeah, of can, can we get into the differences between yeah, I, I uh, wanted to Yes, VA Lord, let's media. talk what, about what, it. What the major let's talk about it. Like realistically, realistically, you can't people hire virtual assistants to do social media social media management work. And it's actually really challenging to try to do both. So you want them to focus on admin and secretarial tasks as well as create content. Just just managing your someone's Instagram account is enough, especially if you have as many followers as Black Wealth Renaissance and y'all stay in their DMs, asking all kinds of questions. Like going through the DMs in itself is, is a lot of work. So the difference is the social media manager is strictly social media related. Okay. The virtual assistant, virtual assistant can look different for different depending on what the business is. But it's basically remote work, admin work, responding to emails, providing that extra customer service level for your business. Um, but honestly, if you if you have the capacity to hire a social media manager and a virtual assistant, do it because it's truly hard to kind of manage both. So who is being a virtual assistant for? I know you just said, you know, you can pull from your previous mm -hmm. work experience, but not everyone was in the office environment. Like who who, who do you think? this is the ideal person that should try to transition and become a virtual assistant. Yeah, I actually always talk about this in my webinar. So to be a successful virtual assistant is probably someone that has, um, that's okay with working from home. One, if you had to work from home or work from anywhere, obviously, but you have to understand your relationship with, between you and the business owner. Again, I've never met, I've only met one of my clients and that was like last month. But before that, I had met none of my clients and you need to be able to take instructions virtually and also be willing to learn their business. Yes, you can bring a certain skill set to them, but you're not going to know everything about their business. Like working with Andre Hatchett over the notary business school. I'm not a notary. I don't know everything about being a notary, but you have to be willing and open to take that instruction because you need to be figure out how you can add value to their business so they'll be willing to keep you around. So mm. someone that's willing to take instruction, someone that's okay with working remotely. Um, if you already are maybe like a stay-at-home parent, or you're a student or something like that, and you need some extra cash, is virtual assistant can be perfect for you because you can, I mean, you can make full-time income on part-time hours if you really know how to do it. Yeah, I was just I was just about to ask you, like, how how busy are you actually whenever you're doing this type of work? Uh, it just really depends. Go so I talk about in my in my um, course on how to make money as a virtual assistant anywhere, like how to 
package your prices where it makes sense for you because ultimately you need to be striving to add value to that business owner. So you could be working um, like 10 hours a week making $250 a week. Hey, that ain't bad. That ain't bad at all. And then what's what's wonderful from that is, again, a lot of there's a lot of apps that are compatible where you can just do things from your phone. So I like to call it Wi-Fi money so you can make money wherever there's a Wi-Fi location. And again, this is a virtual business, so you don't necessarily have to have access to um, I mean, you have access to everyone in the world. So mm -hmm. I even have a client in Germany. So don't think that this is maybe an oversaturated market because you see everyone with the virtual assistant business. You got a solid five to 10 clients, you good. I, I kind of want to go into the, the uh, business owner side of it. When you're hiring a virtual assistant or a social media manager, what is really important to kind of have mm -hmm. in place whenever they're getting hired on until you can have the implementation very easily? That is an excellent question because building a team, anybody that's currently building a team may know that that is easy because you never, I mean, that's difficult because you never know if they're going to be the right fit for your business and your business model. So one, anybody, people always ask, are you hiring for elevated assist? I only hire people who've gone through my boot camp because I then know you've gone through the boot camp and you've gone through a certain training. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to be redundant and teach you certain things. I like that. So, that's smart. Um, I already have a pool of over 200 people whenever I'm hiring. That's the first place that I go. And then I, I interview them, and identify, you know, what qualities they have. A lot of people, some of these people have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees. They are very skilled and they're looking for another uh, additional source of income. And the fact that I'm able to put money in other people's pockets really excites me as well. So it's all about um, seeing what their capacity is and if they make sense for that client, right? So even if I add them to my, add them to my team and I think they're great, they need to be able to fit well with my client that I'm hiring them for. And I like how you already kind of like, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I was about to say, I don't know if you know it, but you're already like vertically integrating off the rip. Like you got you your own school and now you're able to select from who's went through your school. So that's, that's a very smart move on your end. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I got one more question with the VAs. Uh, you mentioned like getting these clients and you didn't really have to do much marketing to continue to get the clients. So if I'm a person, I'm just getting my VA course. I'm just, I just took the VA course. I'm trying to get my first clients. What would you recommend I do? Like, well, how would I go about that? Well, first, how you have a virtual business. How do you look online? Do you, what is your Instagram page? What is your Twitter page? What does your Facebook page look like? You now have an online business, but what is your if someone if someone was looking for a virtual assistant, are you are they able to access you by going to your Instagram? Not even talking about a website yet, because again, Elevated Assistance is doing very very well, and we're still working on the website. So, what do you look like online? Are people able to find you? I always tell people you need to make sure you're positioned correctly so that people can find you um, to set up a consultation, set up some type of discovery call to ask about your services and your business. So, if you don't want to do any paid marketing. Market yourself correctly on Instagram. Again, I have a student that got three clients after 30 days and all she did was create a, a, a Instagram page. Wow. So like, are there specific things that they need to be looking for to like, I guess, optimize the Instagram to let people know, like, are you like putting certain things in your bio or like making like links available to where they can buy? Cause I know you said you did it without a website. Yeah. So within my uh, within my course, I, we have a whole section about marketing. How can you market yourself for a low cost? Because, again, I always tell people, I don't want you to spend a lot of money until you start making money to be able to reinvest in your business. Mm -hmm. So we not even I'm not even telling you, like, OK, go ahead and run and get an LLC. No, because I want you to be a profitable business before it makes sense for you to, to get an LLC and things like that. A lot of people will spend so much money getting a website, getting your LLC, and you ain't even got a client yet. Ain't made no money. Make it make sense. So for me, I tell them like use social media, right? Make a list of every business owner you know. I'm not saying that you got to know them personally, but make a list of every business that you know of mm -hmm. and reach out to them and see if they need a social media uh, manager or virtual assistant or something like that. So yeah, we talk about ways in my class um, on how to be creative, how to reach out to people. It comes with templates and things like that. So mm -hmm. it, what's, what's like the threshold of clients you would typically need to make like the six figures, the six figures in it. 
It all depends on your payment package and social media management is going to be a little bit different from a payment package perspective, because if you're creating content for people, you could create a content calendar for them for like 30 days out, but you can do that from a series of clients and just all do that work, like get all that work done in a series of days and be able to batch, uh, batch your clients very, very quickly. And then sometimes the price point is a little bit different for that, depending on different services that you offer. But for like, say a virtual assistant, um, again, it depends on your price package. So the way that I talk about price packaging in my course is all about how many hours are set up per month that they want to sign on to. Okay. And then again, but you have to be re realistic in what type of value are they getting from you for you to be able to pri uh, price it at a certain amount. I always tell people elevated assist is not the cheapest option, but if you want a valuable service, if you want somebody to help you get additional exposure and things like that for your business, then elevated assist is for you. Mm. And do you get like weekly meetings with uh, with y'all? Like what's all in some of the other services that's like standard, not the tailored stuff. I'm, I'm like for elevated for assist. No, for sure. So again, we want to make the life easier for the clients. So doing my consultation with them, I ask them, how do you like to communicate? Does it make sense for us to meet on a weekly basis? Mm -hmm. Um, do you want us to text you emails, calls, and things like that? So uh, in the beginning, we do a lot of conversation with my clients just to make sure that we're understanding the needs and expectations of the client. Um, and also, we don't want to be a burden to them. They didn't hire us to be a burden, but to take some take some weight off of their shoulder. So we need to figure out, you know, where we fit the best and how we can um, help that business overall. Mm. Hey, that's 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 major, very very major. Yes. Wi-Fi money, get you some. So what, what can they get this course? So again, uh, the best way is to follow me on Instagram at Justin Alisa, J-U-S-T-A-N-N-A-L-I-S-A. -S -S it's going to be a link in my bio. Um, it might, I don't, it might be on sale right now. I honestly don't know, <laughs> but, um, you definitely take advantage. I, it's, it's highly recommended. I've gained, I've gotten really good reviews. Again, as I mentioned, I'm getting, if you don't plan to execute, please don't take my course. It's only for people who's willing to actually make money remotely. I don't, I don't want your money if you're not willing to execute. So pay for the course, do exactly what I tell you in the course and you'll get clients. So with you being an entrepreneur, what's been one of the most difficult things as being the owner now of like virtual assistance? Time. I need, I need time back. So this time next yeah, year. And you're still working a full-time job. So like how, full I, let's go into that. Like, how is this all working together? I mean, I know people look at my Instagram page and they think life's great, but like, Lord, I'll be tired. Okay. <laughs> I'll be tired. I work a lot, but I know it's temporary sacrifice for a long-term gain. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be like this for the next couple of months. The overall goal is to automate processes to eliminate you know some of the long the long processes that I currently have now with mm -hmm. elevated assist we plan to ex uh, expand very largely by the end of the year um, and continue to be a very profitable business yeah um it's I'm tired I mean I don't know what else I'm to tell tired. you I mean some, <laughs> some, day, some days real. I'm able to give 110 percent to elevated assist um some days I'm not able to but luckily I have an assist I have an assistant for myself mm -hmm. my own personal life Again, get you an assistant, life changing. Um, and I have other people on my team that's able to, to take that burden. So now that I'm starting to build my team, it's getting a lot better. Um, so I'm perfecting it and making it better along the way. I appreciate people helping me doing my building process and willing to work with Elevated Assist. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a temporary sacrifice. So you're saying it's a temporary sacrifice. Like a lot of people, they hit a hundred thousand dollars. Like they leaving the job. They think the race what's, is yeah. Over. What's 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 keeping you? No, there? I'm not leaving the job. Uh, no, I'm not leaving the job with a hundred thousand dollars. Look, that might be a lot of money to some people. That ain't a lot of money to me. So I mean, I it's so let let me just paint the picture for you. Like. I need to be able to do certain things. Again, I already told you I like to travel and things like that, but my mom's still working. So until I get to the point where it's just like, you know, mama, you can go ahead and fire your boss. I got you. Until I can say that, then we're going to keep on working hard and keep on making it happen. And I still, it's still things that I want to do. Mm. And $100,000 is definitely not going to get me there. Not in 2021. No, not no. at all. Not at all. And, and for some people, it works for them. But for me and the life that I know that I want to live, that's the question you have to ask yourself. What kind of life do you want to live? What do you want that life to look like? Mm. Um, and I don't even got kids yet. Like that. No, I can't do nothing with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So 
until you get retired, your mom, you're going to still be at the job or is it just until elevator assist hit a certain threshold? I'm going to be at the job until they fire me. Hey, I love to hit. I but mean, the seven's, it's, it's seven's package know, don't sell. Yeah, like, it's good to know that you know, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be there. It's some for show money. They're yeah. going to take you care of my health insurance, like all mm-hmm. of that stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be there until I can't anymore. Um, I, I wouldn't mind the severance package. So, you know, we're going we gonna to keep doing this thing. I'm not leaving no money on the table. <laughs> okay, so at least we want to ask you, um, what's something that you've seen on your timeline? It could be anything on social media, the internet, anywhere. It could be news, uh, anything that, like, stood out to you that you just want to speak on. Yes. Yeah, so Aisha Sheldon, I think she posted on Twitter. It might have been an old tweet where she said something about like in quotations, money doesn't buy you happiness. And then she said poverty doesn't either. And mm. I think we really need to have a conversation about that because people always say money doesn't buy you happiness or people are money hungry. But last time I checked, poverty don't look great to me. Sure don't. So sure I don't they, they can say what they want about, you know, LLC Twitter or people like forcing entrepreneurship down people's throats. But we have to understand, like the, the way that our society is set up in America, it's going to benefit entrepreneurs and business owners more than it's going to benefit employees. So as much as people want to talk about, you know, people with businesses and LLCs, like it's really changing people's lives out there nice. with my virtual assistant program. Like people tell me all the time, like, Girl, my life has changed. Like Mm. I look at money differently now. And what I tell people during my webinars, your nine to five is very likely they're not going to pay you what you're worth. Very likely that they're not going to pay you what you're worth. You can make that company a million dollars, but you're not taking home a million dollars. And if you, if they was paying you what you was worth, that's bad for business on their part. It, it, it is. So you be the, you be the business owner and you'll be able to take off more profit off the top. And it's just interesting how people, how people bash people that start businesses and, all these different things like that. But it's funny because everybody wants to be a millionaire. Those same people are standing in line to win the lottery. Like make it make sense. <laughs> oh, a I one can make in it make sense. They don't they don't want to put the work easy. in. That's the easy. That's the yeah. thing. easy. It's easier to wish and want and be like, oh man, I, I just I pray I get I put two dollars down on this lotto ticket. I pray I'm gonna win this time. Like it's easier <laughs> to do that than it is to go and build a business because that shit hard like it is it's, it's not fun it's real easy for people to to like sit here and talk bad about business owners because like uh even the thing that uh we was just with zay yesterday that they did whenever all this stuff went crazy in texas like yeah with the storm yeah people are looking at them like they talk bad about llc twitter but these are the same people that's trying to help like nobody else trying to help Exactly. All I'm saying is they're going to talk about you if you're doing good. They're going to talk about you if you're doing bad. I don't care. You can talk all you want to. I'm still going to be sleeping well at night and get money. Lil Duval put it to me the best. They said, would you rather be rich or would you rather save humanity? He said, they talked about Jesus. Give my money. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's just the reality of it is. And it's oftentimes people who talk about people that have money are pursuing financial freedom. Those same people secretly wish they were in your position. Mm. I mean, there's a certain layer of enviness, a part of that whole idea. So that's that's what I've seen on my timeline. Again, poverty does not look great to me. Um, I think people should stop bashing people for wanting to live a better life. And then also people, a lot of these people are giving back to their communities. And it's weird that the expectation for people who make a lot of money to try to save everyone you can't that, save yeah, that's, everybody, that's especially people that ain't trying to help themselves. Exactly. You have to be willing to help yourself. I, can, I personally can own, only do so much. So you may not want to maybe purchase a course that I have or set up a consultation and pay for that. But like I've realized that people that actually pay for things really take things seriously. So I've given you enough free, free information with Financial Flex. Google is also available. But me, I am not free. I got it. I got something I do want to ask. And since everybody's a, a business owner, how do y'all feel about Jay Z selling title or the majority stake in title to Square? He's hey, a man. businessman. I feel like every business needs an exit strategy, my brother. What's I'm trying to figure out what's the like, issue? Peep, peep, a lot of people was tripping on that, but they yeah. also don't realize the overhead that it was taken to run title. Exactly. Peep. There's always there's always an opinion on what a business owner should do, but until you've actually ran a business, I don't think you should really talk about anything. Like I until you, until you understand what's what overhead is, what it's like to pay for this, pay for that, just so you can start generating some money. Like it's different. Like 
I, and I think that was a great deal. Like he bought it for very cheap, like 12 million, something like that. And ended up selling his majority stake for like 280 something million. Yeah. It was like 297 million. And then it jumped to his net worth for like 40%. Like yeah. what's well, the issue? I if, don't if, understand. If Jeff Bezos did the same move, what, what would he have been a genius? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, Cause our people, we still we have a misunderstanding of all this shit. Like, but it, they thinking that Jay Z sold this, so like now he don't have no rights within it. He don't do, cause they, and he's still tied to title. Like, yeah, he still has some type of ownership, but he just sold majority stake in it. Most of the most of the people talking about this don't don't even got title on they on their phone. So like, no. move along, like move around. <laughs> That's some real shit. I, and yeah, I, I know mean, for sure I'm, I don't have title. Like, I got Apple Music. I, actually, I know you. I, I know you're title. a title user. I have title, but that's what I'm saying. Like everybody wants to be super critical of black entrepreneurs, and that kills me. That kills me. Like, why are we being overly critical of these people when you see somebody that's not black doing the same thing and y'all don't say nothing? You're silent. Mm. Like, what's? The, I don't understand the issue. So, so these people on Twitter tweeting about what Jay Z is doing. I don't really feel like they have any fight in the article. Uh, the argument one because they probably don't even have title. They didn't even support him in that space. And they probably are entrepreneurs and can't see it from a business from a business perspective. We don't know what he's doing with these extra dollars. We don't know how he's going to reinvest it back into our community. That's a fact. That's big facts. Well, I and Alisa niggas on Twitter, man. <laughs> they do the most, and they do a whole lot of talking. They do a whole lot of talking. I don't even want to talk about them bird app people, y'all. Yeah, they, 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 they about to mess up my energy. I'm about to take my practice. Sierra taught me last week. <laughs> oh, oh, you yes. about to you about to be real zen? You about to be zen the fuck out here? Zen. Nah, I let all that negative energy out. Fuck that. It's <laughs> definitely some weirdos on Twitter that like to see themselves talk, and they just like I'm to argue with people. It. Literally, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like, block people. There's power in blocking. I'm gonna tell a quick story, man. I got, I got to let it be known. I block people. So, like when I was like 14, whenever Twitter was like first popping off, like I, this is why I don't understand cyberbullying. Cause like they had a dude, he had got on my ass. Like he was, he was, ro- he was roasting my ass. Like it was bad. He, he told me I look like Sean Kingston, Mama or some shit. Like that, that nigga was on my top. So like, and I got mad. I'm like, man, man, I'm so upset at these people. And I just blocked this nigga. I was like, you know what? Power, power and blocking. Why why don't people do this more often? Like, if you just block somebody, especially they on some bullshit, you can protect so much of your energy rather mm. than engaging with that person. Mm. And and I think it speaks to a lot of people not wanting be wanting to be the bigger person. Uh, even, like, with video games. When I was younger, man, people were bullied, like, on Call of Duty and stuff. I just turn off the mic. I'd be like, you, you want to be an asshole? Fuck you. We you got to listen that. to this shit. Yeah. Like, and I think people people always want to have the last word or want to feel like, oh, no, you can't do me like that. Just be the bigger person and walk away. I, I promise it feels so much better. Like, you'll be like, oh, I ain't even give them the time of day. You like, keep the power in your hands. Yeah. I think the only time I got dragged on quit Twitter was when <laughs> that you was the first. protecting the black men? Yes. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> I can't hear. Oh. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. And that was the first time I figured out like what a pick me was. I thought I was dying. They told you it was a pick me. Yes, because I tried to support black men, but I mean it was definitely trolls. I don't even know how if these are like wow. real people. But I mean I'm gonna support my people. But that was hilarious. That was like the only time I got dragged on Twitter. Forget them. Yeah. Good Forget times. Them. Protect Good your times. energy, people. Mute and block people is healthy. Yeah, it's definitely really healthy. Thing. No, definitely healthy. But I mean, I love Twitter. It's it's a fun time. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of that. Well, but, yeah. And Lisa, we want to say thank you for pulling up. This has been a dope, dope a episode. great episode. Uh, can you please tell the people where they can follow you, how they can be plugged in with your services, or they want to get an elevated assist for VA service, or they want to cop one of your courses? Let them know everything. Of course, of course. Again, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at JustAnnalisa, J-U-S-T-A-N-N-A-L-I-S-A. You can click the link in my bio if you're interested in setting up a consultation for uh, with Elevated Assist, um, as well as purchasing one of my courses if you're interested in starting your virtual assistant or social media management business. If you are a business owner grossing uh, several thousand dollars a month and you're doing it all alone, I'm telling you right now, getting a virtual assistant or social media manager will definitely change your life. And we can help you elevate your business and take it to the next level. So I would love to work with you all. Hey, y'all tap that link. Hey, look, we're going to put the link in in the show notes so they can just, yeah, get the courses and everything. So y'all scroll down to the bottom, tap that link. Yes, make money on your own time. (laughs) Yeah. There you go. Wi-Fi money. Yes. Get you some. 
But before we wrap this up, we'll get into a little house cleaning. Uh, thank you to everyone who tunes into the show weekly. If you are a new listener, thank you for coming in and listening to this full episode. We appreciate you. Hopefully you got some valuable information from this uh, podcast episode. Let us know what you thought about it. Leave us a comment, a rating, a review uh, below, wherever you're listening to. Mm. Hey, and if you've been rocking with the Renaissance for a long time, I want oh, y'all to shine go up ahead. for the support too. Patreon, yeah, 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 support yeah, yeah. the link for the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah just join Anchor? our Patreon. We have uh, you can support the podcast on Anchor as well if you, you can listen on there. And you can also, I was gonna get y'all if y'all want to be more tapped in with BWI, I know what we have going on, all the new things that we got coming out. I need you to text mm. the word BWR to three three seven. Four five five seven 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 eight. That's three three seven four five five seven 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 eight. Join our, our text message club. Stay tuned in with everything we got offering, and it's only up from here, man. We we trying to get to forty k months, twenty thousand listeners, everything, man. We yes. it's up. Man. Yeah, we need. That. You're going yeah, to get there. That. You're yeah. going to get there. You're that. not trying to. You're, you're doing right. it. I like you're that. doing. I like it. We are working on the way there. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. You're doing it. Well. And Until Lisa, next, once again, yeah. thank you for being here. Until and next time, this is Black Wealth Renaissance signing out. Peace. I got money on my mind. I'm just trying to get some dough. I ain't picking up my lot unless it's money on the phone.